Uh, thanks, Pete, and thanks to Rob and uh, Bill and Rachel for that great, great uh, piece there that just uh, makes us reflect on uh, what this is all about. What's it all for? What are the things that God has given us for? I want us to look at this uh, passage in John 20 and uh, just share some thoughts around it, explore a bit about sharing the grace. Before I do that, here's a little poem dedicated to whoever it was that had the wobbly trolley um, earlier today. Any of you who write poetry will know that every once in a while you get struck by a muse. It's like a drug you have with breakfast, and it means the first thing you see when you go out, you have to write a poem about. It happened to me a few years ago when I was dropping my, uh, one of my sons off at school, and the first thing I saw was a supermarket trolley that someone had dumped in the river. So I wrote this poem called Poetic Justice. It goes like this. Supermarket trolley. Oh, supermarket trolley. Discarded and forgotten like an outdated song. Do you remember the days when chrome bright and jolly you danced like a dodgem through the fruit weighing throng? I know some would accuse me of sentimental folly, but I'm sad to see the drowning of a supermarket trolley. Your mesh is enmeshed now with river weed and slime, and the letters on your handle are irreversibly smudged. And though I could simply say that you've fallen on hard times, it gives me unexpected pleasure to believe you're being judged for all of those times in some crowded aisle or other when I pushed you one way and your wheels went the other. <laughs> okay, never mind, eh? And uh, in a vain attempt to um, take life seriously, here's a poem that links us back into our theme. This is called The Taming of the Truth. Like a football match, where the fans are locked out, while the players take turns on the terraces to cheer. Like a concert, where the crowd sits in silence, while the band plays through headphones so that only they hear. Like a hospital, that keeps itself germ-free and sterile, by only treating patients who aren't sick. Like a spoonful of sugar with no medicine. Like a mule without a kick. Like an ocean liner on a pleasure cruise, purely for the pleasure of the crew. We have taken what was given as a message for the many and made of it a massage for the few. And uh, that is pretty much where we're at, isn't it? That's what we need to think about. What is this all about? I want to take you very quickly, before we come to John 20, let's just quickly do a little tour of uh, where we've been this week in terms of the preaching. We've had some great uh, uh, music and worship and poetry and all kinds of things happening here, but we've also had some people opening up different aspects of John's uh, gospel to us. I want to just remind you of some of that um, and ask a question at the end about uh, where we've got to this morning. If you remember way back to the beginning of this journey, uh, we had Bishop Graham, or Bishop Gandalf as he's now known, <laughs> opening up to us this whole theme of grace, this majestic picture of what the grace of God really uh, means to us. And then on uh, what is known in Spring Harbor circles as day two, it was probably a day of the week once upon a time, but I have no idea what day it was, so I'll call it day two. Um, Sue Barnett talked to us about the story of the woman at the well and how Jesus went out of his way to meet this woman, how he comes alongside us. Do you remember that lovely image? How he sweeps us into the purposes of, uh, of God and it was uh, an evening that many of us found enormously helpful and then our second bishop our number two bishop Pete uh, took us on night three to John 6 and this idea of the sacraments the idea that God makes his grace known to us he comes close to us and Pete took us to a thin place where God could touch us and we uh, we could touch God. Doug Barnett took us to look at the story of the woman caught in adultery, asked us a, a very penetrating question, where was the man? <laughs> uh, asked us to explore what are the enemies of grace that keep us from experiencing the grace of God. And then last night, Steve looked at communities of grace, told us that holiness was not about separation from the world, it's about involvement in the world, asking us where was God calling us to chance our arm and take his grace into the communities in which he lived. What an incredible feast of exploring God's word we've had this week. And different ones of you have, have, have caught different moments of that as very special moments we've got. The question we need to ask ourselves this morning is what is all that for? What is it all for? What happens now? And the passage we're looking at in John 20 uh, is a passage that relates to a group of people who are asking themselves exactly that question. What is all this for? 
there's this group of men who've spent three years traveling with Jesus. They've seen his miracles. They've heard his teaching. He's taken them aside to give them special instruction. He's shared with them. They've become, begun to understand who he might be. They've seen glimpses of the godness of what he's doing. And then they've seen him crucified. And they're locking themselves in a room, frightened that the Jews will come after them as well. And they're looking at one another and they're asking the question, what is all this for? What has all this been about? Where do we take it from here? If Jesus is God, what is next? What do we do with this stuff? And then Jesus appears to them, though the doors are locked, appears among them, and this lovely incident happens where he breathes on them, breathes into them, and says, receive my Holy Spirit. I want to do a couple of things uh, to do with that. I want us to explore what this breathing to receive the Holy Spirit might mean. Three very simple things. And I want us to look a little bit at the character of Thomas who missed the first meeting but turned up for the uh, second one uh, a week later. Presumably in those days he couldn't buy the video, so he couldn't just catch up at home. He did have to actually come back for the second, uh, second helping of the meeting. So let's have a look at this act of Jesus breathing on his disciples. I want to say three things about it that I believe would have been in the thinking of the disciples as they received this kind of sacramental act of Jesus breathing into them. Breath is a really, really important concept in the Old Testament mind, in the um, Jewish mind. And there's some important things that the disciples would have understood by the fact that Jesus chose the symbol of breath to identify that they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Three things about it. First of all, it is an act of regeneration. It is an act of making new. It's an act of birth. Breath was associated totally in the ancient world, still is in some pagan cultures, with life. That's why in Genesis it, just, it says that Adam was made of dust and he was, he, there wasn't anything to him until God breathed into him the breath of life. The creatures that are uh, around Adam and the creatures that are later brought into the ark by Noah um, are set apart from the rest of the creation by descri being described as every creature that had in it the breath of life. You may know if you're involved in some of this stuff that in ancient cultures the point at which a, a child was considered to be human was not actually conception, it was the point at which they breathed because the breath of life came into them. We, may, we think differently now because we have a much better understanding of, of uh, what happens in the womb before that moment. But the, uh, the understanding was there's a huge sense in which when the breath comes, you're alive. Without breath, you are not. And the act of dying is described as giving up your last breath. So breathing has this, all these connotations um, in the Old Testament that are related to new birth, new life, new beginnings. And that's why it's really important that Jesus, in the first opportunity he has after his resurrection, is gathering his disciples, breathing into them and saying, receive my spirit. Because this is the beginning of a new life. Uh, for me, it's quite important. It's a kind of important piece of theology because one of the interesting questions you face if you study the New Testament that uh, is very difficult to resolve is at what point did the Christians, did the disciples become Christians? We know at what point they became followers of Jesus, but in terms of understanding the act of coming to, to Christ as an act of regeneration, passing from death to life, all that theology that says that when we choose to become followers of Christ, it doesn't just change our direction, it changes our standing before God. It's very difficult to pinpoint a point in the Gospels where that happens for the disciples. And one of the ways to resolve that is to see that that's what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is saying here, right, I've done it now. I have died. I've been raised from death. New life is available. I want you to be the first to experience that new life. And he breathes his spirit into them to regenerate them. So it's an act of regeneration. It's a new beginning. But it's also a new beginning that has been promised to the people of Israel for centuries. For centuries, God has been sending his prophets to say, there will come a day when I will breathe my spirit into you. In Ezekiel, you get these lovely images of God saying, I will change your heart, I'll put my spirit in your heart, which culminates in Ezekiel 37. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the passage where Ezekiel sees a vision of a valley of dry bones and there's nothing to them, they're dead and finished. It's a picture of the nation of Israel and, the, and uh, God says to him, prophesy to the breath, that breath would come into them because I am going to breathe into Israel, dead Israel, in a new way and bring it to life. And they rise up as a vast army. And of course, many in Israel thought that breathing of God would be that they would, he would literally breathe breath into the army and they would have a strong army and they would conquer the world or they would throw off the Roman oppressor or, or, or they would, God would establish them as a strong military nation. Lots of things were thought. And here suddenly Jesus is taking the imagery 
about the rebirth of Israel. And he's saying to the disciples, I will breathe into you. And this is the moment of rebirth. So all that has been hoped for, for the rebirth of Israel, is passed on by Jesus to the church. This is what God meant when he said, I will breathe into you and you will have new life and you will have my heart and you will know my spirit. Here's just some stuff that Philip Greenslade says about the promise of the breath of life in Ezekiel. He talks about how what Ezekiel, God promises through Ezekiel, that soft, responsive hearts will replace the hard, stubborn and unresponsive hearts of God's disobedient people. The spirit of God will reinforce the weak and fragile human spirit. God's life breath will be poured into the renewed heart. An action that mirrors the original inbreathing of Adam, which made him a living being. So there's this expectation in Israel, just as God breathed into Adam, he will come again to breathe his spirit into us. And here Jesus is saying to his disciples, "Is that's here, that's now, that's me. And when you receive the spirit of God, when you come to Christ and are made regenerate, you become part of his resurrection, you become part of the new day. You are reborn into a new experience. You are part of the new thing that God is doing. So Jesus is saying to these, his disciples, it is now possible because of the resurrection for me to breathe my life into you. A couple of small things about this that's worth noting. It's also a very important point theologically because it's very important that what happened at Pentecost was that the Holy Spirit empowered God's people but not that that was the first time they experienced the Spirit. They experienced the Spirit when Jesus made them regenerate. And a theology that somehow takes the Trinity and cuts it up into three separate pieces so that you can have this bit of God but not this bit of God is not biblical theology. You cannot be regenerate but by the actions of the Spirit of God. So when you come to Christ, it is by the Spirit that you are born into new life. Now it may well be that after that there are other experiences. What the, what the Pentecost teaches us is that after that, there are other times when the Spirit might come in special ways to empower us. And that's brilliant. And I frankly think anybody that doesn't, well, let's have, bring it on. Let's have more. If your theology has only room for one Pentecost, then you're missing out. I want my theology to have a Pentecost every morning when I get out of bed. I want God to come over and over and over again. If you think you can get through the day without the empowering of the Spirit of God, then I'm not sure what kind of life we're living. So there's loads more, but it is absolutely crucial that we let people understand that it is only by the Spirit of God that we can be made new. So when we come to Christ, it is by His Spirit that He births us into the new experience of His resurrection. You receive the Spirit. So it's very important. um, It's a very important moment for that reason. But it's also important for me for another reason. Some of you have been to see The Passion, I know, in uh, in recent days, and... and, uh, I haven't seen it yet, actually, but everybody I know who's seen it has been moved by it at some level. People have got some comments to make about details of it, but broadly speaking, it's a film that has had a huge impact on people. Here's something that I think is really, really brilliant about what the passion has done in our culture. And it's something that I'm sure Mel Gibson intended, but I'm not sure it's something we expected. We knew that, you know, lots of people have been saying that this film will have a deep impact on people, but I'm really excited, not just by the impact it's had on those who've seen it, but by the shift that has taken place in the media as a result. And here's why. I'm really, really excited that the media has stopped asking the question, is the church relevant? And has starts asking the question, who is Jesus? Because the question, is the church relevant, ain't going to convert anybody to anything. You are not going to be brought to Christ by a relevant and dynamic church. You're brought to Christ by meeting with him in his resurrection power. The point at which people's lives are turned around and transformed is the point at which they meet Jesus. And having a good church is part of that. Of course it is. We need to be on the case to introduce people to Jesus. But if you believe that your techniques of church or your ways of doing worship or the funkiness of what you do or the fact that your pastor has a pierced nose is going to... I'm sure he doesn't actually. But hey, never mind. We can dream. The fact that your bishop... No, no, let's not. (laughs) If you... (laughs) You think that that because your pastor's been to a conference and has read the latest book on how to do church or whatever, that people are going to be transformed. I'm sorry, but they're not. They're going to be transformed by meeting the risen Jesus. And what I love about what's happened because of the passion is that the press is not asking the question, do you like the church or not? The press is asking the question, who is Jesus? And the question that our culture has to do business with is not whether they like the church or not. That's important. But the real question is, who is Jesus? 
That's the question by which people are brought into faith. And it's really exciting that that's what the agenda has become. We are made regenerate, we are made new, when Jesus breathes his spirit into us. It's by the spirit of God and by the resurrection of Jesus that we come into new life. Okay, let's keep moving. Um, You'll notice that... uh, Oh, what happened there? That was interesting. Oh, yes. You'll notice that I never look at my watch when I'm doing these things. So if anybody feels that there's come a point when lunch has burned, just... uh, create a diversion or something and we'll know no it would be all right Uh, secondly this is an act of impartation (coughs) excuse me one of the things that is understood from the Ezekiel prophecy and from other sources in the New Testament is that what God is promising is that a day will come when you don't need to follow the law in this kind of mathematical scientific way because God will put his heart into us And the disciples knew that at the point at which God breathed his spirit into you, it isn't just about empowerment, it isn't just about experience, it isn't just about regeneration, it's about becoming like God. A bit of God comes into your life. I love the line in uh, in Rob's poem from, I think it was last night, I can't remember, uh, which is the real question is, what would Jesus subconscious do? (laughs) Because the transformation of the spirit goes deep into us. It isn't just that it tells us up here what to do, it starts to, tra- the spirit transforms us, he changes us. So we begin to have a subconscious that marries up with the subconscious of God. We begin to have instincts and feelings, we begin to have the heart of God in our lives. And Jesus is imparting something when he breathes on the disciples. That's why it's really important for them that he, he says, receive my, spi- uh, receive my spirit, peace be with you. If you forgive sins, they'll be forgiven, if you don't, they won't. A little aside here for you folks. These disciples are in a locked room because they're frightened of the Jews. Why are they frightened of the Jews? They're frightened of the Jews because the Jews have just uh, come as a mob and have uh, made sure that their leader, Jesus, was crucified in the most horrific way. They are scared, okay? So they're in a room and then Jesus appears to them. You have to ask yourself a question, why, in the disciples' experience, why did the Jews crucify, or why did the Jews push for Jesus to be crucified? The main reason, or one of the main reasons, was that he claimed to have the authority to forgive sins. Because these disciples were with him when the Pharisee said to him, you cannot claim to have the authority to forgive sins, only God can forgive sins. That's what makes you a blasphemer. So it was Jesus' claim that he had the authority to forgive sins that got him crucified. His disciples are scared, so just to reassure them, he comes along and he says, now I'm going to give you the authority to forgive sins. <laughs> so don't wait behind locked doors for the Jews to come and arrest you. Go out and tell them that now you have the authority to forgive sins. Well, if I was the disciples, I would have said, thank you very much. <laughs> what a lovely, lovely thing. We were slightly scared, as Peter was, that they might get us because they thought they'd seen us with you. Now you are telling us that we're going to go out into the streets and do the very things that you did that got you into trouble in the first place. You see, Jesus is imparting something to them. He's passing on something of him into them. He's saying, if you are going to be my disciples, full of my spirit, you're going to start thinking my thoughts. You're going to start doing the things that you saw me do because you are now part of my ministry. And to be honest, I think they probably would have been quite scared until the day of Pentecost, (laughs) when suddenly they were empowered in a way that fear had no place in, and they boldly are able to begin the ministry that Christ has given them. But he's imparting something to them. He's putting something of himself in them. This is a quote that you may have heard before, some of you, it's been around for years, but I... I really love it. It's a guy called Bob Pierce, who was, I believe, the founder of uh, World Vision. And when he was first getting involved in that kind of ministry uh, amongst the poor, lots of people used to ask him, young men would come and say, Bob, how can I have the kind of life that you've had? How can I serve God the way you're serving God? How can I do the works of the kingdom? And his answer was always the same. It was simply this, find out what breaks the heart of God and pray that it will break your heart also. And you see, receiving the Spirit of God is about beginning to feel the pain of God, to feel the disappointments of God, to feel the frustration of God over broken lives. Prayer is very often not about saying to God, we know exactly what you need to do, please do it quickly. Prayer is about throwing yourself on the mercy of God and saying, God, I don't know what to do in this situation, but I want to feel like you feel about it. I want to travail with you in, the, in your 
feeling. So Jesus is imparting something. He's saying to the, to the disciples, when I breathe into you, you become me in a sense. You start to carry my character, my, th- my thoughts, my, um, my heart. It's an act of impartation. And when we receive the Spirit of God, when we receive the grace of God, we receive something of God himself. The very nature of God begins to flow in our bloodstream. And no, it doesn't transform us overnight into supermen and superwomen. <laughs> And no, it doesn't transform us into God, but it begins a different process in our lives. Different thoughts are at work, battling against our own thoughts, trying to establish that we be people who respond to the purposes of God. It's an act of impartation, a giving of something. And then uh, thirdly, and if somebody could just restrain the bishop for a moment, so he doesn't actually throw me off the platform until I finish this bit. Thirdly, it's an act of ordination. <laughs> now, Pete and I, we're very, very, very good friends. And, uh, but the one issue that we've often had a slightly heated discussion about is the issue of ordination. Because Pete is a bishop and ordains people. It's part of his job is to set people aside for ministry. I come from a church where you ordain cocker spaniels. I don't know. We just have, Anybody does anything. You know? we, just, <laughs> we just throw ordination out like confetti. You know? Any, oh, go on. You know? Not really. But there are two different ways of being church. And we, we, you know, I've never in my life really come that close to being thumped by a bishop, except in the issue of order. Not really. It's going to happen, isn't it? <laughs> and of course, when we do get stressed about ordination, Pete's uh, threat to me is that he'll ordain me one day. And that would, uh, <laughs> uh, that would really sort us out, wouldn't it? But it's an interesting thing because Jesus is clearly setting his disciples aside for ministry here. The very fact that he gives them this authority to forgive sins is an act of ordination. He's saying, I have a purpose for you. When you receive my spirit, you receive my spirit for a purpose, to go and do my work. The interesting thing about this is it's a, it, Jesus sets up a slight puzzle by doing this. Because you have to ask yourself the question, who is he ordaining for ministry? Who is he setting apart for ministry? At one level, he's ordaining the leaders of the first church. Because this is like a kind of mini leadership conference. These disciples of his will become, within weeks, the leaders of the first church. So at one level, he's ordaining leaders. At another level, because of what I've just said about the breath of life regenerating them, he's, he's also ordaining the only people on the face of the planet who at that moment are Christians. So he's ordaining the whole church. And to be fair, through history, there has been a bit of a tug of war at different points in history between people saying, is ordination something special for a small group who run the church, or is it for everybody? And the only way you can resolve that debate, the reality is provided in a phrase, which again, my good friend the bishop has provided for us and uses often, which is the phrase, it's very rarely either or, nearly always both and. Because there are lots of things in Scripture that Christians argue about that actually the reality is both are true. And I believe what is happening here is Jesus is in one sense, he is ordaining people into leadership, but in another sense he's ordaining the whole church. And there is a sense in which, in a special way, certain people are set apart for leadership. And that they have to be, uh, that has to be marked in a special way. There is a sacrament that is about setting apart for leadership in the body. But there is another sense in which the body of Christ is ordained to do the ministry of Christ in the world. And that no one is excluded from that. There is a sense in which it is possible to say there is no regeneration without ordination. There is no conversion except conversion to a purpose. We are all called to minister out of the grace that God has poured into our lives. God pours grace into our lives in order that it might flow out from us. And we are all commissioned into the ministry of Christ in the world. That's why, as I think Graham was saying in some of the uh, uh, Ephesians Bible studies, the phrase, the body of Christ. When Paul says, you are the body of Christ, he's not saying the church is a bit like a body. He wasn't providing a convenient trick for Sunday schools later on so that they could draw a body and say, I'm an eye and you're a hand and wouldn't it be... He's saying you're the body of Christ in the world. What Christ did in the world, the church will now do. If Jesus blessed the poor and healed the sick, the church will now do that. If Jesus was the doorway to salvation, the church will now be that. It's a sacramental calling. It's a holy thing to be set apart to be Christ in the world. And when we receive the Spirit of God, we receive a call to purpose. It's a, we are set aside for the ministry of Christ. Just a little quote. This actually comes from a, 
a, a management manual. It's written for business people, but it's really interesting how many people in business are now recognizing the need for a central core purpose in our lives. Purpose is that deepest dimension within us, our central core or essence, where we have a profound sense of who we are, where we came from, and where we are going. Steve reminded us last night that when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, it says he knew who he was. That's why he washed their feet. And God calls us when we receive his spirit, when we come to know him, to know who we are and to enter into purpose in our lives. The church does not exist so that 200 people can gather in a room so that two people up the front or one person up the front can have a sense of purpose. In fact, interestingly enough, and again this was in the Ephesians teaching uh, that you've been having in the mornings, the very purpose of setting people apart into special ordained leadership is so that they will release the body into their ministry. Every single one. We are called to be ministers of the grace of Christ in the world. And when we receive grace by God's Spirit, it is received so that it can be shared. We are all called to purpose. Coming to Christ is coming to purpose. And Jesus sets apart his disciples to carry grace into the world. Why does he use the, 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 the image of forgiveness as a mark of that purpose? Well, I think there's lots of reasons and we can't go into all of them, but one of them is this, because that's the secret. Uh, I have this working definition that I've shared with some of you this week of grace, that grace is the announcement that the future does not need to be dictated by the past. Grace is the announcement that change is possible. Grace is the announcement that forgiveness is possible. And Jesus understands what C.S. Lewis understood uh, almost 2,000 years later, that what makes the Christian gospel unique is the announcement of grace. Because when every other thought system and religious system in the world says whatever you've got you've got and you've got to deal with it grace says no grace says no matter how twisted you are either by your own actions or by the actions of others no matter how hurt you are no matter how wounded you are or no matter how much you have wounded others grace says change is possible forgiveness is the key to unlocking God's grace and so Jesus is saying to his disciples I am giving you a key when you receive my spirit, you receive this key, this announcement, this news that forgiveness is possible. Don't hide it, he's saying. Don't hold on to it. Don't keep it a secret. Make it what Leslie Newbingham calls the open secret. Let people around you know that forgiveness is possible, that change is possible, that grace can invade their lives. Jesus calls us, gives us this great treasure and calls us to share it with those around us. Okay, so it's an act of regeneration, it's an act of impartation, and it's an act of ordination. We can use the language differently, but in a sense Jesus is saying, if you're called to leadership, then enter into that calling and let us set you apart. But if your call is not to leadership in the church, you are still commissioned, ordained, set apart for the ministry of Christ in the world. To belong to Christ is to belong to his team. Okay, then there's this last thing with uh, Thomas. Um, I love the story of Thomas. I love what happens in this incident. Thomas misses the first meeting, like I said, comes back at the second one. And I want to just dwell on this for five minutes because the way Jesus deals with Thomas is, for me, one of the most profound pictures of grace in the whole of Scripture. Partly because I'm a bit of a Thomas, so I guess I relate to it because I ask a lot of questions. And, you know, and let's, you know, I'm up here on Spring Harvest platform. I'm supposed to be... We're all supposed to be rock solid in our faith. I have to tell you, I wake up some mornings. In fact, I woke up two days ago in the middle of spring harvest and I thought, what would happen if Jesus wasn't actually God? Now, I know that's not supposed to happen, folks, but I know it happens to you as well. And there are a heck of a lot of Thomases around who have questions. And the questions pop up at the most inconvenient moments. Just when the person has got up out of their wheelchair and everybody's hallelujah, and you think, I wonder if that really happened. You know those questions? And they're in our minds. And the way Jesus treats Thomas is a lovely message of grace for those of us who have questioning minds. I think it's a bit unfair that Thomas has been called Doubting Thomas. I think he was actually quite a determined person. And he was determined to know. I don't know whether he was set back by skepticism or whether he was spurred on to know the truth. But I think there's some interesting stuff there. He wasn't with the disciples. The disciples came to him and said, We have seen the Lord. Now, you have to ask yourself, why did Thomas say, unless I can put my hand into his side and touch the holes, I won't believe it? 
Why did he say that? Was it because he was racked with doubt or because he knew something that the other disciples didn't know? And I think there's a possibility that what Thomas knew that the other disciples didn't know is that unless Jesus has physically been raised from the dead, then history has not changed. And the disciples say, we've seen Jesus. And Thomas is really saying to them, did any of you check? Was it a vision of Jesus or was he there with you in the room? Did any of you think to ask or to check? Or did you just say, what a great meeting. We're off home. You see, Thomas's questions were not questions that were, that they were questions that were, that were causing him trouble, but they were not questions that were born out of a spirit that resisted faith. They were questions about a desire to know, because he knew that if Jesus is physically raised from the dead, then history changes at that moment. He knew that if Jesus is physically raised from death, everything changes. It vindicates everything about the life of Christ. It makes it absolutely clear that he's God, and the whole world turns on that moment. So he's saying to the disciples, okay, you're saying you've seen Jesus, but you're not telling me whether that's what's happened or not. I want to know. I need to get into this. I need to really know. The reason I think that's the case is because of what happened next when he came back a week later and the way Jesus treated him. Let me tell you what Jesus would have said if he was a good evangelical preacher. He would have said in front of the others, you've been a very naughty engine, Thomas. <laughs> he would have said, Thomas, come on. All these other people have no problem accepting me. What is your problem, Thomas? Why can't you simply accept like these people? And he would have said, Thomas, if you're not prepared to accept without seeing, then leave the room now or at least go and stand in the corner. Because you're naughty. Because, and that isn't what Jesus does, is it? What does Jesus do? He says, Thomas, come here. Thomas, I know your questions, and I know your struggles, and I know your desperate need to know. Come and put your finger in the holes in my hand. Come and put your hand in the wound in my side, because you need to know, and I want you to know, that I am risen from the dead. I want your questions to bring you closer to me, not to drive you away. Bring your questions over here, Thomas, and we'll answer them. You see, the significant thing is Jesus did not say to Thomas... You must abandon your need for evidence and take a leap of faith in the dark like the rest of them. He said to Thomas, bring your need for evidence over here and I will give you some evidence. Because he respected and loved Thomas and actually he loved his questions. And when he then says, what Jesus then says to Thomas is really interesting. We translate it as stop doubting and believe. What actually, the, word, the, the verb stop in the, uh, in the original text is actually stop becoming. What he's saying to Thomas is stop becoming an unbeliever and become a believer. So actually what Jesus is saying is not, don't, he's not saying stop asking questions. He's saying let your questions drive you deeper into belief, not deeper into unbelief. Bring your questions to me. Because when you bring your questions to me, you will find they drive you to the truth rather than driving you away from the truth. He's saying to Thomas, change your direction. Don't lose your energy. <laughs> Don't lose your passion for the truth. But change your direction so you're being driven into faith, not away from faith. And he embraces Thomas with his questions. And the final reason why I think this is a fair understanding of what happened is what happened next which is that Thomas looks Jesus in the eye and becomes the first human being in the history of the world to look at Jesus and say, you are God. Now, the disciples didn't do that. And I checked all through the Gospels. There's Jesus, maybe, maybe not the Son of God, a little bit of you are the Christ, the Messiah, God's chosen one, but never has anyone understood because of the resurrection that Jesus is God. And Thomas is saying, Jesus, you have answered my questions. I am not somebody who will always doubt you. I just had some questions that needed answering. And you've answered them. And now I know, because of the resurrection, because you are physically present in this room, not an apparition, not a vision. It wasn't because the disciples all had the same cheese with their supper and got caught up in some kind of corporate delusion. It wasn't, see, it wasn't Jesus that Thomas mistrusted. It was actually the other disciples. It wasn't too clear on what they were saying. But he's saying, I know that you are not a vision or an apparition or a ghost. You are Jesus 
physically raised from death. And that means that you are God. And he becomes the first man in history to acknowledge the fullness of the deity of Christ. Well, I'm sorry, but that doesn't sound like doubt to me. He is a man who is transformed. He's transformed by the grace of Jesus because Jesus graciously invites him to bring his question. Now, why do I think this is so important? I think it's important because that is what we are called to do as a church. You see, I believe we've sent a message to our culture which says that we're here behind locked doors in this church and when you have decided to believe, come and join us. Or we have people in our meetings and we say in the meeting, when you have decided to believe, come to the front. When you can believe as those around you believe, God will accept you. Jesus doesn't say that. Jesus says, come with your questions, touch me and let me answer your questions. When have you ever heard an evangelist say, I want all the people in this room who don't believe to come and meet Jesus? Come with your unbelief. Come with your questions. Because what the church is supposed to be is a place of grace that says, bring your doubts and your questions. Bring your honest strivings. And we will not reject you as a doubter. We will receive you as someone who has honest questions which God wants to answer. And I think there are many, many people in our culture who are being kept away from Christ, not because they don't want to believe in him, but at the moment they can't. Because they can't see it. They've got too many questions. And the church, rather than saying, come to us and talk about your questions, the church is saying, when you've answered them, come and meet Jesus. Well, you all know that that ain't going to happen. Because it's not until you meet Jesus that the questions are answered. And one of the interesting things about this, I spoke about this in our church the other week, and I happen to know at the moment that there's a couple of people in our youth group who are doing what young people often do, which is uh, unbecoming Christians. And letting all the youth leaders know that they're not interested in their their heart. And I I spoke to the parents of one of these girls the other day and I said, you must understand that that spirit of questioning, that spirit of inquiry is not something that will exclude your daughter from faith. It will probably give her a stronger faith than the rest of these kids around her when she finally meets Jesus and finds answers in him. Because the inquiring spirit, the passionate spirit actually leads to greater faith, not lesser faith. But there has to be a welcome and an openness and a grace. So I believe that Jesus embraces Thomas and gives hope to many of us. Because he says, come with your doubts, come with your questions. Like the centurion who when Jesus said, do you believe I can heal your servant, said, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Lord, I believe, but I come to you acknowledging that there are days when I don't believe. I come to you acknowledging when I'm sitting, you know the feeling, you're sitting in that room and everybody else in the room believes that a spaceship has just landed on the roof and Jesus himself has come down the ladder, come into the room and told us the precise day, time and location of Armageddon. And you're thinking, am I the only person in the room that doesn't really believe this? And Jesus says, bring your unbelief, bring your frailties and your fragilities to me. And it is in touching Jesus that we find the truth. It is in touching Jesus that our questions are answered. It's in touching Jesus that we find um, ourselves. I do think, I find that a lovely uh, picture of grace. And I love the fact that it's after the resurrection, almost at the end of the gospel, that Jesus is demonstrating to his disciples that it is really still all about grace. It's still a grace thing. I'd just like to read a poem uh, to, to finish this uh, time. This was actually written for uh, at the dedication of a child, a young man called Daniel Lee, who must be now, now about six or seven years old, I think, child of a friend of mine. And I wrote this for his dedication. But I, was, I feel it's, I just want to use it as a prayer, really. It's a prayer for a child, but it's a prayer for the kind of faith that we all want to know. It's a prayer that says, uh, this is what we want for each other. As we leave a place like this, having received the breath of God, having drawn close to Jesus, having spent time drinking in his strength and his grace this is our, I take this as a prayer for one another and uh, I don't know if you want to close your eyes but it's addressed to a child but then it's also addressed to all of us out of your sweetness may strength come forth in weakness may a strong heart grow in your dependence may faith take root From wide-eyed wonder may wisdom flow. 
May the lions you face meet a warrior. May you dance on the high fields of praise. May rejoicing run like a river through the valleys of your days. May you stand in your inheritance and live as a child of the king. May your ears be tuned to angels in the wind-whispered glory they sing. May you carry a furnace fire of hope when the world falls dark around you. May you find in your heart forgiveness when others unthinking hurt you. May you know as deep as DNA in the bone marrow depths of your soul you are known, you are loved, you are valued. Though you fear it, you are never alone. May you walk in the cool of the evening in the garden your maker has given. May you bring to trembling fragile earth the certain touch of heaven. May your eyes never lose the wonder of the miracle of your birth. From your heart come love. From your life come truth. From your sweetness may strength come forth. Amen.